I'm tired of praying and not saying nothing. I'm tired of worshiping and nothing shifted. I'm tired of praising God and being stuck in the exact same predicament. In the back of my mind, I've become an atheist and an agnostic. And I want to know, is God still real for me? Because I see him in other people. But what has he done for me lately? God, if you're going to touch me, touch me now. Second Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 9 and 10. I want you to find it. I want you to declare, I have it. If you can't find it, say, Lord, help me. Man, that's a lot of y'all. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 12, verses 9 and 10. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That's why. For Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You may be seated. I want to preach for a little while this morning using as a subject, it's hard for me to open up. It's hard for me to open up. Would you, would you look at the person beside you and tell them that's my testimony? Look at them and tell them, can I be honest with you? It's real hard for me to open up. Comrades reaching into the annals of Greek mythology we meet the fantasized ultimate deity known as Zeus, who's supposed to be God of the universe. Two underlings that were titans in their own right were Prometheus and Epimetheus, who pledged their allegiance to Zeus because of their loyalty. They were entrusted with the task to create creatures that would inhabit the earth. Epimetheus was assigned to design animals while Prometheus was entrusted to mold man. When the prototypes were complete, he asked permission of Zeus to give man fire. And Zeus declined his request because he believed only gods should have fire. Prometheus ignored Zeus and gave man fire anyway. As a punishment, he was banished to a mountain and was tormented daily. Zeus didn't believe that that punishment was adequate. He felt as though man ought to feel some pain and suffer as well. So he created a sister by the name of Pandora. It was the most beautiful of all specimens. She, in fact, received the gifts of wisdom, beauty, kindness, peace, and generosity and was dispatched to the earth to be the wife of Epimetheus. Before Prometheus was banned, he told his brother Epimetheus, never accept a gift from the gods, for it always have strings attached. As a wedding present, Zeus gave Pandora a box 
with a warning never to open it. Pandora, who was created to be curious, couldn't resist, and she opened it. And immediately greed, envy, hatred, pain, disease, hunger, poverty, and warfare came out. She tried to put the lid back on the box, but by the time she put the lid back on the box, the only thing left in the box was hope. So hope is the only thing humans have left to hold on to. Hence the expression, don't open Pandora's box. It translates to mean anything that is best left untouched for fear of what might come out of it should not be bothered. My dear friends, while that story is fictional, there are far too many of us in real life who feel like we have to keep parts of ourselves locked away because we are uncertain as to what will be the impact on the discoverer and the effect of those who are in our intimate circle. It's the invisible thread called embarrassment used with a thimble called shame. It's that same thing where we convince ourselves if we don't talk about it, we won't have to deal with it. It's the fear that haunts us, that gnaws at our heels, that suggests if they know this about me, will they still love me? If this ever comes out, will I still be respected, regarded, appreciated, loved? I can't tell them that. Why? Because that will make me vulnerable. When you don't realize that vulnerability is God's form of naked beauty. It's the willingness to do something with no guarantees. It's finding the carriage to say, um, I love you first, not knowing how they'll respond. Unsure if it's too soon. Vulnerability is having to hold your breath while waiting for the doctor to call you back. Vulnerability is having to always initiate intimacy with your spouse. Vulnerability is having to start a conversation after the silent treatment. Vulnerability is having to tell your friends you're about to go through a divorce. Vulnerability is having to tell your family you've been laid off. Vulnerability is trying to find the right time to tell the people that matter you're sick and we hate it. Vulnerability makes you sick on your stomach. Vulnerability makes you dizzy without a headache. And yet we all have to deal with it. In this book that I want to entrust to you, the book is called Daring Greatly. How the Carriage to be Vulnerable Transforms Your Life. The author's name is Dr. Bryn Brown. And she says that vulnerability is defined as uncertainty with risk and emotional exposure. With that in mind, faith is vulnerability. Life is vulnerable. The irony of vulnerability is we love when others open up, but we hate when it's our turn. 
in that basement growing up, you love truth a day. Till the circle ends up on you. Contrary to the perception, vulnerability is not weakness. Vulnerability, hear this, sounds like truth and it feels like carriage. And so many of us have sentenced ourselves into a shell and the people who think they know you only know the ambassador of you. Because you've never let them in the embassy. The defining moment of every relationship is when you decide, will I tell them or is it worth it? And in that moment, you decide who they're going to be to you. In that moment, you then make the decision whether you believe they'll be around for the long haul or whether they can handle it. And what's backwards is you've trusted people with your body before you could trust them with your secrets. The enemy has conditioned us to numb our vulnerability. This is the generation that is most in debt, most obese, most addicted, most medicated, most sexed, and the most secretive. The issue is that you can't selectively numb emotions. You don't get to peer in the Pandora's box and anesthetize shame, grief, disappointment, fear. When you get numb, all of you is numb. So you can't even feel joy, can't even feel gratitude, can't even feel peace, can't even feel happiness. As a matter of fact, you become so numb you feel nothing. So nothing matters. Your new favorite word is whatever. It rolls right off of you. You can go through the trauma of your life and completely unfazed because you are emotionally disconnected and detached from anything and everybody and people who don't understand your testimony think you're arrogant. They don't know. You're numb. So I don't even feel nothing when you leave because I never expected you to stay. I'm numb. I've been stabbed in the back so many times. I'm afraid to look at how much blood is on my shirt. I'm, I'm numb when good stuff happens to me. I pause, embrace myself because I believe another shoe was getting ready to fall and it ain't going to last. I get numb that I don't even need alcohol. I'll sleep all day. My house don't even have lights on and the electricity works because I'm numb even have the energy to cry because that takes too much work I'm numb so please don't try to befriend me I don't want friends I don't want people talking to me if if you're nice to me I get suspicious if if you try to help me I'm trying to figure out what your angle is I'm numb and the problem ladies and gentlemen I'm so numb I can't feel God So I'm in church and I can't even feel nothing. I see folk worshiping and giving God praise and lifting their hands in thanksgiving. And I try to go through the mechanics of worship. But if I'm honest with you, I ain't felt God in a long time. I'm tired of praying and not seeing nothing. I'm tired of worshiping and nothing shifting. I'm tired of praising God and being stuck in the exact same predicament. In the back of my mind, I've become an atheist and an agnostic. And I want to know, is God still real for me? Because I see him in other people. But what has he done for me lately? God, if you're going to touch me, touch me now. You don't even realize how numb you've become. You're so numb that you can't worship because worship is an act of vulnerability. God, help me in here, huh? 
you, you, you expect me to cry out loud and lift up my hands and I'm, I'm not sure what's going to happen when I do it because I understand that there's a risk involved in worship and I, I've been so deluded by neo-Pentecostal expressions that will tell me that if I shout then this will happen but I did that and nothing happened and every now and again God wants to see will you be vulnerable enough to worship me when you don't know what I got in store for you will you bless me even if you gotta stay in that same house even if you never get a raise even if you never get married will you still bless me in your vulnerability So when God sees us as being untouchable, he got to make us go through something. And he'll make us go through something. And the aim and the intention is just to make us more vulnerable. Hallelujah. You didn't hear what I just said. I, I said sometimes God will make you go through something that ain't for you. It's because you ain't broken enough. Stuff in your life is going too good and you think you in here doing God a favor so God said let me put the squeeze on you so that you understand you ain't my peer that you gotta look up to me and so I gotta squeeze your life second Corinthians chapter 12 Paul says something that's foreign to 21st century Christians. Paul says something, watch this, that it will be alien to most of our ears. Watch what Paul says. Paul says, I am so secure in my relationship with God. Watch this, that when you hear me testify, I do not testify about stuff. When you hear me worship God, it ain't about my car, my house, my job, or my money. The devil can't mess with me because when I worship God, this is what Paul said, I worship God because of my weaknesses. Hallelujah. And I'm so sick of saints who sit in the sanctuary and act like they're perfect. But the reason why you ought to be giving God glory, he blesses me even in my area of weakness. He blesses me even where I'm broken. Hallelujah. Be, be seated, please. I'm coming around the mountain. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy God. I, I need you to elbow the person beside you. Tell them I'm anointed with issues. Hallelujah. I'm broken and I'm blessed. I'm flawed and I'm faithful. That's why the devil can't stand me. Because he knows all of my issues. And God keeps elevating me anyway. I will bless the Lord at all times. And Paul says, watch this, I worship God because of my weaknesses, because I have figured out through an intense investigation why I have these weaknesses. I need you all to stay with me. I understand why the pain in my life is so great. Paul, please tell us why is the pain so great? He said the pain in my life is so great because of the depth of the revelations I have. If God had not shown me anything, I wouldn't have to go through anything. And I'm talking to those of you that have an unfulfilled prophecy over your life. You think God just gonna give it to you without you having to go through a fight? You are built for this. You gotta go through this because the call on your life is so significant that generation yet unborn are going to be anointed if your dream ever comes to pass. Look at the person beside you and tell them you're not regular. If you were regular, you would have a regular attack. But because you are supernatural, the attack on your life is extraordinary. He 
you show me something? Be seated, please. He's, he's shown me something. Hallelujah. He's, he's shown me something. What eyes haven't seen. And, am I shy? And, what ears have not heard. I, I need you to elbow your neighbor and tell him, I wish I could tell you what he showed me. But if I start talking about what he showed me, I'll flip these green chairs over. If, if, if I begin to talk about what God promised me, you would be amazed how I'm able to sit still. I, I said I wasn't going to tell nobody, but I just can't keep it to myself. God said the revelation that I gave you is so, is so powerful. Is so critical, is so vast that I need you to go through pain. I need you to hear this. I need you to go through pain just to stop you from being conceited. You have to live with a certain level of pain. Watch this, so that you can in fact keep your humanity in perspective. Without pain, you will think that it's all about you. But when you gotta go through something painful and still be assured that God's hand is on my life, you'll understand better the way that I worship is because I understand it ain't about me, but it's about the God that's over me that I must decrease that the Son of God may increase. He, he gives me pain to keep me humble. Paul said, this pain is so dramatic. It's so blood curdling that this pain made me pray. I know I got a gift. I know I have an assignment. I know I have a vision. But this pain is so damnable that now it's the only thing I pray about. And watch um, what the apostle tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It messed me up. He said, I pray because I got a thorn, watch this, in my flesh. I'm not going to keep you long. I know y'all got stuff to do. And uh, Paul says, I am not confused. I know what this thorn is. Stay with me. He said, this thorn, I need y'all to stay with me, is a messenger from Satan. I'm getting ready to lose y'all. I need y'all to stay with me. Keep your Bible ajar because I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to see what the word of God said. He says, I prayed three times. Lord, take this thorn out of my flesh because this pain that I have is a messenger from Satan. I need y'all to stay with me. I feel like I'm getting ready to lose you because after I get through here, I'm going to take off. Watch this. He said, I prayed three times. Lord, take this pain away from me because this pain that's a thorn in my flesh is a messenger from Satan. Pastor, why do you keep giving me that? The reason why I keep giving you that and referencing you, referring you back to your Bible is because he said the thorn in my flesh, watch this, is not a message from Satan. No, it ain't a message from Satan. So when Paul is praying and crying out to God, he's saying, watch this, I need you to remove the messenger from Satan. So what is causing Paul pain, y'all watch this empowerment, is a person. So he's crying out to God, Lord, I need you to move out of my life. This person that keeps bringing me pain. God, I can't hear nobody because they don't want to see me fulfill the call of God that's on my life. Remove this person. If I could just get this person out of my system, if I could just get them out of my spirit and out of my heart, I'd be able to live completely for you and God said I'm moving them nowhere I'm gonna keep them right there just so you can live through your pain isn't it amazing 
that Satan is going up and down to and fro looking for somebody to devour and God asked of Satan where you been he said I've been looking for somebody he said have you considered my servant Job and Satan said yeah I thought about him but you put a hedge fence of protection around him and God said I'll tell you what I'm going to do I'm going to give you a provisional license you can touch all of his stuff but you can't touch your soul y'all went through Sunday school but did you look at the text so Satan came and took his houses took his businesses took his children took his money took his investments y'all ain't gonna like this but the question the preacher never asked is if Satan took all of that why did he leave Job's wife God, y'all ain't saying nothing here. If you're going to leave me with somebody, leave me with somebody that's going to encourage me. Don't leave me with somebody that got no faith. Don't leave me with somebody that don't have a prayer life. Leave me with somebody that'll give me a blueprint to rebuild. Says, why? Why don't you curse God and die? And God said, I'm going to leave that one person in your life. You know that one person? That one person that brings cussing out of you. God, I can't hear nothing about that. That, that one person, y'all ain't saying nothing. If it wasn't for them, you'd be celibate. That one person. I, that, that, that one person, I can't hear nobody. If they weren't in your life, you would remain focused. But God said, I'm going to leave them there because they don't even know they're working for me. Hallelujah. I want to thank God for every person that thought they were setting me up. Because even while they thought they were pulling me back, God was getting, re getting ready to push me forward. I need you to look at your neighbor and say, I'm thankful for all the people that don't like me. Because he said, my enemies will be my footstool. If I don't have any enemies, then I can't have a footstool. He said, I prepare a table in the presence of my enemy. If I got no enemies, then I got no table. But I tell the enemy, you meant it for evil. But God is going to work it out for my good. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I'm not one of your enemies. I'm one of your real friends. And when I give God glory, I'm shouting for every mountain he brought you over. I'm shouting for every valley he brought you through. I'm giving God glory that you should have been dead, sleeping in your grave. But you woke up this morning with your mind stayed on Jesus is there anybody here that can shout in the face of your enemy I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eye is on the sparrow y'all didn't come to have church I said shake that neighbor's hand and shake it real good tell him I've been lied on I've been talked about I've been mistreated I've been left for dead My heart got broken They stole my money But this joy That I have The world Didn't give it And the world I need you to shout in the face of your enemy Shout in the face of your hate. Be seated, please. And God says, watch this. Something that I'm not sure you ever paid attention to. God said, I am not taking them away. I'm going to leave them right there so you can find out that my grace is sufficient. He says something peculiar. He says, watch this. 
you won't know my power until you recognize your weakness. I'm in 2 Corinthians, I'm in chapter 12, I'm in verse number 9. It's going to blow your mind this time. Look at what the Bible says. It says this, watch this. Paul says, so I discuss my weakness so power can rest on me. This is countercultural to the neo-Pentecostal tradition uh, because we've been raised to believe that in order for the power to rest on us is that we got to begin travailing at the altar. And for the power to rest on us, watch this, it comes only after a season of fasting. For the power to come on us, watch this, it is necessary for you to have protracted praise and worship. But Paul says, I found out my recipe for getting the power of God in my life is to talk about the areas I'm weak in. Oh God, I can't hear anybody. See, silence is what the enemy wants you to be. Because he knows if you ever start talking about, hallelujah, just because you see me in church, don't get it twisted. Hallelujah, I got a story that most of these saints ain't ready for. I, I smoked some stuff and snorted some stuff and slept with some people. But that's why the power of God rests on me. So he said, for Christ's sake, I now take delight in my weaknesses. I get excited when people talk about me. Every time I'm betrayed, let down, set up, sabotaged, that's when I start giving God glory. Because they don't even understand the weaker they try to make me, the stronger God creates me. I ain't talking to everybody. I'm just talking to a small remnant in the room who know if it had not been for the Lord on my side, I would be bitter, I'd be angry, I'd be upset, I'd be drunk, I'd be high, I'd be under the bed. But I've come this far by faith. God said you needed all of this just so you could find out how strong you are you don't know how strong you are until you figure out how much weight you can lift and many of you are world class bodybuilders because you've been bench pressing stuff that would have thrown other people's back out Somewhat like Samson, people have to ask, what makes you so strong? That you're able to speak to people who you know don't like you. You're able to keep carrying on when you should have thrown in the towel. What makes you so strong? Hallelujah, that you can bless people who you know would never do the same for you. But you just got it in your heart to be a blessing to other people with no strings attached. What makes you so strong? I was in uh, Scottsdale, Arizona this week. At a retreat for um, the top 100 black pastors in America. Everybody's there from uh, Bishop Jackson, Bishop Walter Thomas, all the way down. Top 100 black pastors in America went on this mountain for four days. Pray to thank, to strategize, to commune, to refresh, to de disconnect. And uh, we had this exclusive retreat, and uh, I might add, it's, it's not free. Yes, um, it's not free. I want to say it again. It, it, it wasn't free. Yeah, yeah I, didn't, I didn't say we was in Ocean City. We was in Scottsdale, Arizona. And, and um, it's by invitation only. It's very exclusive. And uh, one of the top uh, rated resorts in America. That's, that's where it is. Just 100 of us. And uh, I preached uh, all Sunday services with you all last week. Then got on the plane, headed on to Arizona. 
flew all day, four hours and 45 minutes. Get to Arizona. I'm tired. Get to the resort, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I mean, it's, uh, it's high cotton. I mean, it's, it's the cat's meow. I mean, I was, I, mean I, I, I was embarrassed just being there. I didn't even know how I got there. And uh, I, I, I check in uh, to the front desk. When I check into the front desk, uh, they say, welcome back, Dr. Brown. We're glad to have you. Uh, you in the eucalyptus suite. I said, Lord, the eucalyptus. I said, Lord, I, I, I done, Mama, we done made it. I mean, say, to her, get, get your bags. We, we got a golf cart that's going to drive you to your bungalow. I said, Lord, this, this is nice. And uh, she gives me two sets of keys uh, in order for me to stay, get into the quarters uh, where I'm staying. And I got to use an electric fob to get through the gate. This is just my property. Ain't, ain't, ain't no roommates. And ain't, this is just where I'm staying. Everybody else somewhere else. And I need a fob just to get through the gate. And uh, when I get through the gate, uh, then the uh, guy that drives me on the golf cart leaves me and says, Dr. Brown, we'll see you in the morning. I said, all right, see you. And uh, go through the first level of the gate. And uh, now I got to use the key. I get use the key to get into the glass pavilion. I'm telling you all, this is it's major. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm a runaway slave right through here. So I, I got to use the key to get through the glass pavilion. And I put my key in, watch this, and uh, open uh, the latch to get into uh, this glass enclave bungalow. And uh, when I open up the latch, uh, the whole latch falls off the door. And I've been flying all day and um, in the air four hours and 45 minutes. And uh, I'm one of the youngest people who are there. And uh, all of them got New York Times bestseller, write movies and all of that. So I'm trying to be dignified when I call the front desk uh, to air my complaint. Because I don't know if I take this ain't free. Uh, so I, I call the front desk and uh, she answers the phone knowing my name, Dr. Brand, in the eucalyptus suite. How can I help you? Is there anything wrong? I say, yes. Something is wrong. I said, I flew four hours and 45 minutes after preaching for three services at Empowerment Temple. And uh, the, the guy on the golf court drove me here to my bungalow. And I get through the front uh, gate. And I get now to the glass pavilion. And I put my key in that you gave me five minutes ago. And I open up the latch. And the whole latch done fell off. She said, oh, Dr. Brian. I'm I'm so sorry to hear that, but maintenance is gone for the day. And that, that door is just going to have to stay open till 6 a.m. I said, sis, I'm from Baltimore. <laughs> we had 350 murders last year. <laughs> I can't sleep with the door open. She said, oh, Dr. Brian, you ain't got to worry about that, do we? We got a 2% crime rate here in Scottsdale, Arizona. You going to be safe? I said, no, I, you, you, I'm, I'm from the city. I'm not used to sleeping in the mountain. <laughs> There's stuff out there. Ain't no serial killers black. I need to make sure. <laughs> she said, no, no, no. She said, Dr. Brian, can't nobody get to you? I said, are you sure? She said, did, did, did you forget that when you got here, you had to first go through the gate? And in order for you to have the gate, you had to have the right pass. Your door don't even really mean nothing. It's the gate that's important. And nobody will be able to penetrate that because they don't have the equipment. God, y'all ain't saying nothing to me. I said, what am I supposed to do with this broken door? She said, didn't you say you from Baltimore? I said, yeah, I'm from Baltimore. She said, well, this ought to be a treat for you. I said, what do you mean it ought to be a treat? She said, now that the door can't close all night, you'll be able to experience the wind. And you haven't had fresh wind blow on you for a long time. Y'all, I got to go. 1130 is coming. But, but if the door was working, you wouldn't have access to the wind blowing through. This is only for my Bible readers. Don't you know that the Holy Spirit is like the wind? 
You don't know which way is coming and you don't know where it's going. But you ought to thank God. My brokenness is what let the wind come through. And I'm talking to those of you that need a fresh touch from God. God said, I need double dare you to worship me with your brokenness. And watch the Holy Spirit occupy every area of your life. But as long as you try to act whole and dignified and perfect, the wind can't come through. But is there any brokenness in this room that would say, Here am I, Lord. Send your Holy Ghost. I want you to lift up that hand. Your brokenness, your vulnerability is, going what, is what's going to let the power of God come into your life. There's given me to be a, a level of worship that perfect people can't even anticipate or appreciate. But those of us who, who know their testimony is here I am weary, worn, and sad. But I found in him a resting place and he has made me glad. I want you just for 60 seconds, not for what God has done. I need you to worship God, watch this, for the broken areas of your life. I can't hear nobody, I said worship him with that short temper. Come on, worship him with that sharp tongue. Wor worship him with that unfocused mind. Every area of my brokenness, I give it back to him. And y'all gonna sit here and act like you don't need repair. Like you don't need an adjustment. Like you don't need fixing. Come on, I need you to lift him up. I need you to cry out on our God. I I can't hear anybody. Come on, you functioning alcoholic. Come on, you secret addict. I need you to lift up your voice and cry out under God. Come on, you philanderer. Come on, you gossiper. I need you to shout with your broken. I'm vulnerable. I'm vulnerable. I can't believe y'all are there crying. I said I'm vulnerable. I don't usually open up like this, but I heard Jesus is passing by. This ain't the time for me to shut down. This is the time for me to open up. Softly, Sean, lift that hand. I want to pray over your vulnerability. I want to pray over the area the enemy keeps poking. I want to pray for that spot that's tender to the touch. I want to pray for that space in your life that still has not been yielded over to him. Come on, lift up that hand. I'm giving back to you all the tools you gave to me. My storage is empty. And I'm available. Come on, lift up my hand. I'm going to pray for you for just, in just 30 seconds. But before I pray, would you mind just worshiping God with a broken heart? Would you worship Him with flawed character? Would you worship him with missteps and mistakes? And those of you who have firsthand experience that his grace is sufficient. I said, if you got firsthand experience that his grace is sufficient, I want you to clap, shout, yell, dance in the face of the enemy. Because he thought he was going to hold all of that over your head. But by the power of the Holy Ghost is under your feet. 